Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And a reminder, as you're making travel plans, remember johnnydollarair.com. johnnydollarair.com is a Priceline affiliate. So part of the purchase price goes to support the great detectives of old time radio at no additional cost to you. So when making your travel plans, remember to check johnnydollarair.com first. Now it's time for our final Yours Truly Johnny Dollar serial. The original air dates, October 31st, November 1st, and November 2nd, 1956. It's the Silent Queen Matter, episodes 3 through 5. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hiya, boy. Vic Carson in Hartford. Say, things are really opening up out there on the coast, huh? So, you read the papers. Quite a surprise, learning that Mavis Gale was married to that penny arcade operator, Barney Slade. She'd been married to Tom Sanford. Sure, silent film actor. Only it turns out he and Slade are the same man. Really something, isn't it? Yeah, well... Here, Sanford's supposed to be dead for 27 years, and all the time he's living down there in Ocean Park, and she didn't know about it. So she said... Only somebody saw her hanging around the arcade two nights before Slade's murder, Vic. What? Well, what does she have to say about that? She wasn't around when the police went out to her place a little while ago. No one knows where she is. Look, have you been able to get an angle on those photographs of hers in Slade's apartment? Why the killer drew those question marks over? No. And we haven't found out why the killer copped a half a dozen of the photos either. Photographs of who? How should I know? They're gone. Well, maybe they're important. No. Look, I'm on the trail of a character called the Preacher. If I find him, I may find some answers. Well, according to the papers, it... Johnny, are you sore about something? Yeah, Vic, I'm sore. Better read my report. Tonight... And every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Ocean Park, California. To State Unity Life, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, The Silent Queen Matter. Expense account continued. (laughs) Item 9, 55 cents, one scotch and soda at a local pub. This was right after I talked with you, Vic. Yeah, I guess I was a little sore. Maybe it was because of that phone call earlier from Sergeant McKay. When he told me that old-time screen star Mavis Gale had been seen hanging around the arcade where Slade was murdered. Okay, so Mavis Gale was in line to receive $25,000 as the beneficiary of Slade's insurance policy. I suppose he figured I was itching to get something on her so the insurance company wouldn't have to pay off. I downed the rest of my drink and walked over to the Penny Arcade in the Ocean Park Amusement Zone. You back again? Yeah, I'm back again, Twyla. If you're looking for Sergeant McKay, he's... You sure about what you told him? That you saw Mavis Gale in here several nights ago? I'm sure. Recognize her picture in the morning paper. Well, you didn't volunteer this information to McKay until this afternoon. I sleep late. Okay. So Tuesday night, Mavis Gale showed up. Around eight, she said. Well, I couldn't swear to the time. It, it was around then. Well, exactly what did she do? I told the sergeant. Well, tell me. When I first noticed her, she was standing just inside the front door, like maybe she was waiting for somebody. Was Barney here in the arcade at the time? No, Barney was back there at that test-your-strength machine. It was busted. And 
I was helping fix it. Oh, hi, Mr. Jessup. Evening, Mr. Dollar. Evening, Twilight. Hi. Yeah, Mr. Dollar, Frank here's pretty good with electrical stuff. So? So I helped Barney fix the machine. Look, Twilight. I mean, what happened then? What did Mavis do? Well, she waited around another ten minutes, maybe, and then beat it. Did Barney see her? Did he, Frank? You mean Mavis Gale was in here the night he was fixing the machine? So Twyla says. Do you think he noticed her, Mr. Jessup? Kind of hard for me to say, Mr. Dollar. We were both pretty busy fooling with that machine. I didn't notice her, that's for sure. Look, Mr. Dollar, don't you believe I saw this Gale dame here? You need half a dozen witnesses. Okay, Twyla, don't get excited. Uh, Twyla, what I come in for, me and Gus are going to drive over to the mortuary, spend a little time with Barney... I know you were there. Oh, yeah, that... sure. Sure, I- I'd like to go again, Frank. I'll get one of the boys to take over the change booth for an hour or so. Thanks. And be around eight. Well, I'll see you around. Uh, but... Just a minute, Mr. Jessup. I'd like to ask the two of you something. Sure, go ahead. I've got a list of names here. Barney may have mentioned any one of them to you. Now, stop me if he did. Milo Martin, George Sheldon, Jarvis Pocket. Stop. Huh? Yeah, Sergeant McKay already asked us. About that uh, fella called the preacher, too. We never heard of him. Okay. Thanks. I wandered around the pier for a while, trying to figure out my next move. McKay wasn't around, and it was a cinch Mavis Gale hadn't returned to her Bel Air estate. So the only thing I could do was to keep on trying to track down the men who'd been on that hunting trip 27 years ago with Tom Sanford, alias Barney Slade. Milo Martin, number one on the list, hadn't been able to give out with anything exciting. But he had given me a five-year-old address on George Sheldon, number two on the list. Expense account item 10, $15.10. Cab fare and tips on the trail of George Sheldon. It blew hot and cold until late that night when I wound up at a bar in downtown L.A. Yeah, old George worked here for a while. Handyman, sort of. At... That was I.W. Harper, you said? Right, it was Soto. So, you're an insurance investigator. Wouldn't be a cop, maybe, instead. No. Now about George. Just wondering is all, friend. What's he done you want him for? I'd just like to talk to him. You sure? I'm sure. It figures he wouldn't be getting into no trouble. Real sweet fellow. Real sweet for a fellow who had it rough. And believe me, he had it rough. Used to be an actor. I know. Had it real good during the silence, you understand? Then along comes the talkies and old George. Him having a voice three tones higher than an air raid siren is out. Oh, it happened to a lot of them. Only for old George, this, coming on top of a busted romance, this is too much. He starts hitting the bottle and Wait a gets minute. down. And... What romance? Oh, movie actress. She up and married another guy, so... Her name wouldn't be Mavis Kale, would it? <laughs> Say, funny you ask that. Oh? Her name's all over the front pages. You read the story? Yeah, yeah, I did. You mean that this... Nah, nah, this wasn't the romance. Old George had a yen for some doll named uh, Josephine Hinch, or something like that. Say, uh... You wanting to talk with him, it got something to do with that Penny Arcade murder? Yeah, that's right. Now, where can I find George Sheldon? Well, the address is 1712 South Glendale Avenue, Glendale. Thanks. Another drink? No, I'll finish this. And I'll be on my way. You know, I kind of miss old George since he left us. Yeah, sure. Real sweet fellow. Yeah, kind of miss the old preacher, too. The way he used to rant and rave. What did you say? About the preacher? Yeah. Old guy. Was a friend of old George. Used to come in here and read him the riot act about his drinking. Wave his arms around and holler. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This preacher, what's his name? Mm -hmm. Let me see now. Kind of screwy name. I ought to remember. Runs a rescue mission somewhere around here. What a friend help. Sure. Your name's Pocket. Jarvis Pocket? Right on the button. Thanks. Here's your five bucks. My pleasure. Oh, and friend, since you've been so generous, well, that address I give you on old George... What about it? Well, save yourself the trip. It's a cemetery. Old George has been dead for a couple of years. 
Jarvis Pocket had been number three on my list of the men who'd gone on that hunting trip 27 years ago when someone had tried to murder Tom Sanford but got killed instead. Now that it turned out he was also the preacher I'd been looking for, well, that could turn into a big break. Expense account items 11 and 12, $6 even, tipped to above-mentioned bartender and cab fare around L.A. Skid Row looking for the rescue mission. It was a neat-looking affair. All the lights in the main hall were on, and as usual, the place was open for business. Seek and ye shall find. So, my brother, <laughs> seek ye the way of the Lord, for along that way lies... There was a good crowd on hand. I eased into a seat alongside a bleary-eyed pilgrim who reeked of bad sherry. I looked around. The, way, oh my the bottom of the barrel was here. Repent your sins and put down that bottle. The brothers were listening to the good man up front, but they weren't really tuned in. They were just waiting for a bowl of soup and a place to flop. Peace, peace, my brothers. In him alone is your salvation and your hope of everlasting life. <laughs> Open your hearts to eternal joy, and the glory shall be yours. We will now sing hymn number 32. When the singing was over, I got caught in the crush, and the next thing I knew, I was holding a bowl of lentil soup in my hand, and I realized I hadn't eaten all day. Meanwhile, I kept my eye on Brother Parkin and waited for a chance to get to him alone. That happened about five minutes later when he walked out. I followed him down a long, dark corridor and into his office. Oh, please sit down, young man. Thanks. My name is Johnny Dollar, Brother Pocket. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh. Frankly, I thought you were a policeman when I saw you out there seated with my flock. Been expecting the law? Yes. You... <clears throat> Excuse me. I knew they'd be coming around sooner or later regarding that long friendship of mine with Barney Slade. Yeah, goes all the way back to the days he was known as Tom Sanford when you directed silent films. Check? Check. How long have you known Tom was alive, using the name of Slade? Oh, Mr. Dollar, I was witness to that horrible affair that took place during that hunting trip 27 years ago. Oh? Somehow, during the course of that day's hunt, I became separated from the others. Then suddenly I came upon Tom struggling with a man in a deep ravine. The would-be killer? The man with the shotgun? The other man fell, the gun went off, and he was killed instead of Tom. Go on, Brother Pocket. Well, immediately I told Tom we should find the others, tell them what had happened, that he would have none of it. Is that when he told you he preferred to let the world believe he was dead? And I suddenly realized it. Probably would be best for all concerned. In what way? Well, Mr. Dollar, Tom was constantly involved in trouble of some kind. Drinking too much. Gambling, women, brawling. He knew what it was all doing to Mavis, but he couldn't help himself. Believe me, Mr. Dollar, he loved her. Passionately. Made her life miserable. And his own as well. I see. Uh, Brother Pocket, about the would-be oh, killer. I, I know, I know what you're going to ask. The name of the man that tried to kill Tom. Yeah, you knew him? Oh, yes. So did Tom. Only the two of us knew his identity. You're forgetting someone else. Hmm? Huh? The person who hired him. Hired him? Well, oh, Mr. Dollar, what makes you think he was hired? So maybe I'm wrong. Am I? I was never quite certain myself. Did Tom think he was? Oh, no, 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 definitely no. At least as far as Mavis Gale was concerned. Yeah, quite right. Did you share his opinion, Brother Pocket? Yeah, as I said before, I, I could never quite make up my mind. Oh, why not? Did you think Mavis Gale incapable of doing such a thing? Hiring someone to kill off Tom? No, I, I, I'd rather not say. Okay, okay. So who was the man who tried to murder Tom? What was his name? I'm afraid it'll mean little to you, Mr. Dollar. His name was Joe Fallon. Well, you're right. It means nothing. Well, this fact, however, might prove interesting to you. Joe Fallon, at one time, had been Mavis Gale's personal chauffeur. <laughs> Johnny Dollar. Oh, it's you. Hiya, Sergeant. Headquarters just gave me this number to call. I was wondering who'd be in Barney Slade's apartment. How'd you get in? With a key. Brother Pocket had it. Give me that again? Jarvis Pocket. 
He's one of the men on that hunting trip with Tom Sanford 27 years ago. He's here with me now. How'd he get it, the key? Barney had given it to him a few years back. He's known all along that Barney Slade and Tom Sanford were one and the same. He also knows the name of the man who tried to kill Sanford. Who was it? Name was Joe Fallon. At one time, he'd been Mavis Gale's private chauffeur. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Ocean Park, California. To State Unity Life, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Silent Queen matter. Expense account continued. Locating Brother Jarvis Pocket, who now ran a rescue mission along L.A.'s Skid Row, had been the only real break I'd had in the case so far. At least I hoped it would be. The one-time film director of the silent era had often visited with his old friend Tom Sanford, alias Barney Slade, might put us on the track of Slade's killer. I watched Brother Pocket as he paced back and forth across the small room, scratching his chin thoughtfully, glancing up at the blank spaces on the wall where the photographs had been. He was still pacing the room when Sergeant McKay arrived. How about it, Mr. Pocket? As I told Mr. Dollar, Sergeant, I'm positive that this entire wall was covered with photographs. Uh Uh-huh. And now there are several missing. Were they photographs of some particular star? Oh, no, no. Action shots made during the filming of a picture that I directed for Miss Gale. Let me see, what was the title of that one? Well, maybe that isn't important, Brother Pocket. Who was... Wait a moment, I... I, I, Yes, uh, it was called Dangerous Little... No... Dangerous Lovers, yeah. That George Sheldon starred with Mavis in that one. Was Tom Sanford in it, too? Uh, oh, Tom, yes. Best role he ever had. Well, how about the next row of pictures? Mm, yes, well, uh, a, a photograph of Mavis and Tom, I believe. I can't recall the title of that film, a dreadful thing. Francis Trevelyan talked them into it and directed it, too. It should have stayed behind the camera where it belonged. And the bottom row, were they photographs of Tom Sanford and Mavis Gale? Uh, yes, yes, I'm certain of it. Uh, that picture was... Brother uh, Pocket, uh, would you say that Tom had changed much since those photographs were made? Well, not too much, no. He put on a bit of weight. His hair turned gray, of course, thinning on top. Or he'd grown a small mustache, too. How about it, Sergeant? You'll notice there isn't another photograph of Tom Sanford left on that wall. Okay, so assuming the killer took these away because they might identify Barney as Tom Sanford... And link him with Mavis Gale? Yes. Yet the killer went to the trouble of drawing red question marks over the other photographs of Mavis Gale. To deliberately draw attention to her. Why? Mavis Gale would have been involved anyway to a certain extent. After all, she is the beneficiary of Slade's insurance policy. Sure, sure. But suppose the killer wasn't aware of that. Uh, $25,000, I believe, is the amount. Yeah, that's right. And you're wondering why he did it. Oh, I can make a guess. You said he'd been pretty reckless, tossed a lot of Mavis Gale's money around in the old days. May have amounted to something close to 25,000. Possibly. This may have been his way of scrying the account. 25,000 bucks and a king-size shock. He could hardly be expected to guess that his death would come about under these circumstances, Mr. Dollar. No, no, but he could have passed away calmly in his sleep some night and wouldn't have changed a thing, Brother Pocket. Mavis Gale would still have been curious about a man named Barney Slade. Yes, I suppose, yes. He must have been pretty sure she'd recognize him, that it would make a nice big splash in all the papers. Was he that much of a ham? Tom, uh, I'm afraid so. He couldn't have loved Mavis Gale very much. Oh, Mr. Dolly, right to the last, yes. Still, he couldn't resist the magnificent gesture, the big payoff, returning her 25,000. You know something, Dollar? Now you sound like you're on her side. Yeah. Well, uh, gentlemen, if that's all that you want me for, I think I'd, I'd best be getting back to my quarters at the mission. The flock may be getting a little restless, huh? <laughs> you know how it is. There are times that one of the brothers will sneak a bottle of sherry into the dormitory and things become quite gay. <laughs> sure, Mr. Pocket. You can run along and uh, thanks. Well, good night, gentlemen. Good night. Well, Sergeant, what's the next move? What about this Joe Fallon? You said he'd been Mavis Gale's chauffeur at one time. Yeah. Pocket saw the whole thing. The attempt to kill Tom Sanford 27 years ago. Fallon and Sanford were struggling. A shot went off and Fallon got it full in the face. Sanford then decided to play dead. Yep. 
But ever since then, Sanford was hiding out down here under the name of Barney Slade. That is, until somebody caught up to him, caught on to it three nights ago and killed him. Big question still remains, who? Come on, let's get out of here. I'll get it. Yeah? Uh Uh-huh. Right, I got it. That was headquarters. They just got a call from Francis Trevelyan. Trevelyan? He was one of the men on that hunting trip, along with Pocket and the others. Yeah. Seems Mavis Gale just heard we've been warning to ask her some questions. She wants us to come right over. She's at Trevelyan's beach house in Malibu. The beach house turned out to be one of those super modern jobs, low, sprawling with a lot of glass and flagstone. The butler allowed us through the front door, and after a nice little stroll, we finally arrived at the den, a 50-footer at least, with a bar at one end. Mavis and a tall, distinguished-looking gentleman were at the other. Evening, Miss Gale. Good evening, Sergeant. I'm terribly sorry about all this. I didn't know you wanted to talk with me. I should have left word at the house, I suppose. But I was so upset, anxious to get away. I understand. Oh, this is Francis Trevelyan, Sergeant McCain, Mr... Dollar. We met at the funeral home. Oh, yes, I... I remember. Uh, Do sit down, gentlemen. May I offer you a drink? No, thanks, Mr. Trevelyan. Now, Miss Gale... Yes? When I first informed you of Barney Slade's death at the Penny Arcade at Ocean Park, you told me you never met the man. That's right. I had no way of knowing it was Tom. Not until last night when I went to the mortuary. Had you ever been in or near the Penny Arcade at any time, Miss Gale, previous to the murder? Yes. Two nights before. Why didn't you mention this to me when I spoke with you before? I don't know. I was frightened. A man named Barney Slade had been murdered. The killer had drawn question marks on my photographs in the dead man's apartment. Were you afraid to tell me because it would involve you deeper? Yes. I think that was the purpose of the phone call, Sergeant. What phone call? That evening, shortly after six, I received a call from a man. He wouldn't identify himself. He said that a very dear, very old friend of mine was in trouble and needed my help. He instructed you to go to the arcade in Ocean Park? I was to be there by eight o'clock, and this old friend was to make himself known to me. So you went. Did you see anyone? No one that I recognized. Miss Gale, does the name Joe Fallon mean anything to you? Fallon? Why do you ask that? Just a moment, Mr. Trevelyan. Why, yes. Joe was my chauffeur. Many, many years ago. And when did you discharge him? Shortly after my marriage to... to Tom. Did he tell you to get rid of Fallon? Yes. Yes, he didn't like Joe. Uh, Mr. Dollar, may I ask you why you're questioning Miss Gale about Joe Fallon? Because we just found out he's the man who tried to murder Tom Sanford 27 years ago. He was the man killed. The man we all thought was Tom. That's right. Was Joe Fallon in love with you? Uh, Now, see here. Better answer. Was he, Miss Gale? I... I... I don't know. What are you two driving at, Sergeant? I I insist on knowing. And I'd like to know why you jumped when I first mentioned Joe Fallon's name, Mr. Trevelyan. All right, all right, I'll tell you. You see, I'd, I'd quite forgotten about him... It was only when you asked Miss Gale that it, it suddenly dawned on me who he was, and it, it startled me, because his name had been brought to my attention only some 24 hours ago. Oh. A, a phone call. A man who said he was in partnership with Joe Fallon. They had a business deal to talk over with me. And? Well, I simply told him that I wasn't interested. I was in the midst of my most important production, and I just couldn't be bothered. Did you receive a similar call, Miss Gale? I know. You know, Sergeant, I'll give you odds. It's the same one who called Miss Gale before the murder to get her down to the Penny Arcade. But I don't understand. Why? Who is the man? When we find that out, Miss Gale, we'll have the killer. Here's your hotel, Dollar. Oh, yeah, right, thanks. Been a long day, hasn't it? Sure has. We haven't made much progress. At least Brother Pocket was some help. Uh Uh-huh. Cigarette? Yeah, thanks, thanks. Yeah, Pocket gave us a couple of answers. We could sure use a lot more. 
thanks. You know, Sergeant, that bit about the photograph still bothers me. Why would the killer first try to hide the link between Mavis Gale and Tom Sanford and then deliberately draw attention to her? You think someone beside the killer could have made those question marks on her photographs? Could be. Okay. For instance... Who discovered the body? Twyla James. Okay. You mean she walks in, discovers the body, picks up red crayon, does the art job? Why? Well, look, I just make these things up. I don't explain them. <laughs> You're off the beam on this one, Johnny. When we got to Barney's place, she was shaking like a ship without a rudder. Nah, she was scared silly. Uh-huh. I'd still like to ask her about it, though. Better get some sleep, Dollar. I guess. Thanks for the lift, Sergeant. Night. Yeah, the sergeant was probably right about Twyla. But I sauntered on down to the amusement zone anyway. It was late and the place was folding up. There was a nice warm breeze blowing in from the sea and the night was calm. So I continued along the oceanfront, crossed over into Venice and kept right on going. The old canals and the bridges looked more sad and forlorn than ever in the pale moonlight, with the sea in the background adding its lonely rhythm of sound. The shot had come from somewhere over by the canals. Then I saw the man on the bridge staggering, weaving like a drunk. I headed toward him on the double. But before I could reach him, he stumbled and fell on his face. Here. Let's see how... Pocket. There. Back there. Pocket. This is Dollar. Johnny Dollar. There. Over there. He kept pointing across the canal, and then I saw the figure slinking away. I took after him. I scrambled across the bridge. And then along the canal... And then I lost him. I pulled up on the bank of the canal, looking around. Listen. Nothing. Then, suddenly, something. Footsteps behind me. But I heard them a second too late. Oh! Johnny Dollar. Uh, good morning, Mr. Dollar. This is Milo, remember? Oh, Milo Martin, the agent, yeah. Yes, I've just read about that terrible affair about Jarvis Pocket murdered. Oh, this is a terrible thing. <sighs> yeah, he didn't even make it to the hospital. Uh, and you, Mr. Dollar, the killer tried to do away with you, too, huh? All I got was a nice crack on the head and a not-so-nice dunking in the canal. Uh, you were fortunate, Mr. Dollar, extremely fortunate. Yeah, yeah. Anything else you wanted to talk about, Milo? Oh, yes. I'm sorry I wasn't at the office when you called earlier. But your secretary gave me part of the information I was after. She remembered a man had phoned your office yesterday. Yes. She said he was a business associate of someone named Joseph Fallon. Well, I was, I was out at the time, but he did leave that message. Well, what I wanted to know is, did he ever call back? No. No, he didn't. He probably will. Unless he figures he's already found his pigeon. Pigeon? What for? Blackmail, Mr. Martin. Blackmail. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Ocean Park, California. To State Unity Life, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, The Silent Queen Matter. Expense account, final page. Twenty-seven years ago, somebody had hired one Joe Fallon to murder Tom Sanford, the husband of silent movie star Mavis Gale. But Joe had muffed the job. Now that somebody had turned killer himself. His first victim, Tom Sanford, who'd been going under the name of Barney Slade and running a penny arcade in Ocean Park. The second, Jarvis Pocket, who could have helped us spot the killer. The only two others who might help us were actor Francis Trevelyan and actor's agent Milo Martin. And both had received phone calls from the killer. The reason? Blackmail, obviously. Item 13, $1.35 cab fare to police headquarters. Morning, Sergeant. Hello, Dollar. How do you feel? Oh, okay, I think. You turn up anything on Pockets, killer? Only this. Two slugs taken from the body, fired from a thirty-eight. From the same gun that killed Barney Slade? The same. Well, that figures. Oh, I wish a lot more did. Hey, look, just what have we got anyway? 
Maybe you better start with what we haven't got. Well, Barney Slade gets clobbered by a killer who scrawls question marks all over Mavis Gale's photographs in his dingy apartment. To draw attention to Mavis Gale. All right. Mavis is named as a beneficiary in Slade's insurance policy. Claims she doesn't know the man, then takes a look at his body and identifies it as husband Tom, who supposedly was killed 27 years ago on a hunting trip. Right. Then Jarvis Pocket, one of the men who'd been on that trip, fills us in with the info that Mavis Gale's ex-chauffeur had tried to knock off Tom. Yeah, but he goofed the job and got knocked off himself. Question. Had Joe Fallon been hired? Answer? Probably. Question. Who hired him? (laughs) There's a beaut, huh? Say, this Milo Martin ever get in touch with you? Yeah, just before he came over. He got a call, all right, apparently from the same man who called Trevelyan. Mm-hmm. Trying Fallon's name on for size. Oh, he's trying to get a reaction, that's for sure. And when he gets the right one, he'll put on the squeeze. I wonder why he didn't call Mavis Gale and give her the pitch. Maybe he did, and she, uh, forgot to tell us about it. Think he called Jarvis Pocket? No, no, I think Pocket would have told us. I wonder if Pocket told us everything last night at Barney's place. Oh, probably not. I think he suspected something or someone. When he left us, he probably did a little prowling of his own. Result, got himself killed. (laughs) Look, it's almost noon. Yeah, yeah. I'll buy you lunch. We'll have about an hour. Then what? Then I'm going to Tom Sanford's funeral. Aren't you? They buried Tom Sanford, alias Barney Slade, that afternoon under cold gray skies that made it look like it would rain any minutes. But that didn't keep the crowd away. All Barney's friends from the pier were there, including Frank Jessup, who ran the mermaid bit, and Twyla James, who pushed pennies at the arcade. Mavis Gale, of course, was there, along with Francis Trevelyan and Milo Martin. And there were the usual spectators who came out of curiosity. When it was all over, the sergeant and I started down the hill. Hello there, sergeant. Mr. Dollar? Oh, hiya, Frank. Mr. Jessup? Sure was a nice ceremony, wasn't it? Yeah, very nice. Pier was practically closed down. Everybody here for the funeral. Uh, We're all going to miss old Barney. Somehow I just can't bring myself around to calling him Tom. Don't seem to fit somehow. Sure. Well, I, uh, I got to get back to Twyla. She's taking this kind of hard. Oh, yeah, sure. I was kind of surprised the way Miss Gale stood up. Real brave she was. No tears at all. Yeah, I noticed that. Sergeant? Maybe she was all cried out, Dollar. It happens, you know. Uh Uh-huh. It happens. I went back to my room at the hotel later that afternoon and stretched out on the bed to do a little thinking. Sleep, something I hadn't had much of in the past 24 hours, finally caught up. When I awoke, it was dark outside. After a shower and shave, I wandered on down to the amusement pier again. No particular reason. Then I remembered I still had the key to Barney's apartment. I flicked on the light switch in the living room and sat down. Then as I reached around for an ashtray on the small table close by, my sleeve brushed several medicine bottles to the floor. I was picking them up when somebody came in through the back door. Mr. Dollar? Oh. I happened to notice the light under the arcade door. What are you doing back here? Well, uh, nothing in particular, Twyla. I'm afraid I accidentally knocked these off the table. Oh, no harm, I guess. Poor Barney won't be needing them anymore. Well, he had quite an array here. Medicine, pills... Yeah, Virus of some kind. Hit him like a ton of bricks a month or so ago. Oh? Did he go to the hospital? (laughs) No. Not Barney. He wouldn't hear of it. Well, who took care of him? Oh, Frank Jessup, myself. Between the two of us, we did the cooking and saw to it he got his medicine and all. Wait a minute. I thought you said you'd never been in Barney's apartment. Yeah, that's right. First time was when I... I found the body. Well, look, if you and Frank took care of him while he was sick... It was over at Frank's place in Venice. Oh. Yeah, Barney and Frank and a couple other fellows were playing cards. Suddenly, Barney wasn't feeling so good, so he decided to lie down for a while. That's when the game broke up. Frank stayed with Barney, and when he saw how bad his fever was, he called Doc Ferris. Doc Ferris, huh? Yeah, lives over in Venice. Thanks, sweetheart. Lock up for me. (laughs) 
Expense account item 14, $1.50, cab fare and tip to Doc Ferris's place in Venice. Barney, he told me, had been a pretty sick man, high fever, delirious at times. But Frank Jessup had stayed by his bedside during the crisis and had done a good job of nursing him through the night. Expense account item 15, $1.50, same cab, back to the amusement zone. The attendant at the mermaid bit told me that Frank Jessup had gone home early. Expense account item 16, 75 cents, cab fare to Frank's bungalow in Venice. The place was dark. No answer. You looking for Mr. Jessup? Oh, yes, ma'am. Oh, you know, you he know. just left a few minutes ago. Out for a walk, I guess. Oh, that's so? Do uh, you know which way you headed? Down the street. That way. Good, thanks. I finally caught sight of him a couple of blocks later. He was headed south along a back street. I trailed him all the way out to 47th Avenue. Sand dunes, oil wells, a scattering of houses. Then I saw him duck into some shadows, so I waited. About ten minutes later, a big Cadillac came along, cruising slowly. As it reached the corner, someone inside flicked out a package, and then the car disappeared into the night. Frank Jessup suddenly darted out of the shadows, scooped up the package, and came running straight toward me. Hold it, Frank. What? I said, hold it. Let go. Let, let go. What are you doing here? I don't have to ask you that question, do I, Frank? And I don't have to guess what's in that package. Let go. Not a chance. Huh? All right. Look, Dollar. You get a good thing here, maybe? We have. Sure. Sure, why not? 50-50. That the deal you offered to your old friend, Barney Slade? Look, look. I, I didn't want to kill him only when I went there the other night and told him what I had in mind. He, well, he got sore. Started pushing me around. How did you find out about Barney's past? That time he was sick, delirious, fever make him do a lot of talking? That's right. So Barney spilled the whole thing without knowing. Come on, Dollar, let's get out of here. Pocket guessed you were behind it all, didn't he? Figured that's exactly how you found out, so you had to get rid of him, too. Look, Dollar... Hold still, little pal. Now, who tossed out that package of money? Come on, Jessup! You called somebody on the phone and got a nice, fat reaction when you mentioned the name of Joe Fallon. Now, who is that somebody? I am, Mr. Dollar. Uh Uh-uh. Easy there. I'm a good shot. Well, well. The actor's friend and agent, Milo Martin. Thank you for holding our little friend here, Mr. Dollar. It makes things a lot easier. Huh? Your little friend was running a bluff on you, Martin. I don't think he's got the proof that you hired Joe Fallon 27 years ago. Oh, really? Perhaps not, but I couldn't risk it. Now, could I? So you thought you could make a little time with Mavis Gale if husband Tom was out of the way, that it? Yes, but I was wrong. Didn't even give you a tumble. Too bad, Milo. A stupid woman, really. is quite stupid. And now, little man... Look, Mr. Martin, we can forget all this. Don't be ridiculous. We can't. And by the way, we haven't met, have we? Allow me. Frank Jessup, he runs a stall down at the amusement zone. Mr. Martin, you've got to trust me. I, I can keep my mouth shut. <laughs> I fully intend to make certain of that, Mr. Jessup. Look, all we're going to do is get rid of Dollar here. Oh, you're a sweet kid, aren't you? Nobody will ever know, Mr. Martin, I swear it. You're so right, little man. No one will ever know. Let go, Dollar! Hey! Frank pulled away from me somehow and started racing across the sand dunes, but he didn't get very far. Milo Martin pumped two shots into his back. That meant he took his eyes off me for just a split second, and that's all I needed. What? I belted him where he was very, very soft, and then followed with a hard uppercut. Milo, 10% Martin, folded without a sound. 17th and final item on expense account, $185.10. Hotel and incidentals in Ocean Park and transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $436.25. End of accounts. Remarks? About Frank Jessup. He got his out there in the sand dunes for the murders of Tom Sanford, alias Barney Slade, and Jarvis Pocket. About Milo Martin? In jail, awaiting trial for murder of the above-mentioned F. Jessup. About Mavis Gale? She's going to see to it that the good work at Brother Pocket's rescue mission goes on. We'll donate $25,000 to the cause. Yeah, you guessed it. That'll be the insurance money. End of remarks and a report. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star with a special announcement. Yes. 
I think you'll be glad to know that beginning Sunday, instead of five times a week, we'll be on the air only once a week, but with a complete half-hour story. Remember, that's beginning this coming Sunday. So join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. This week's story was written by Adrian John Doe. Heard in the cast were Paula Winslow, Virginia Gregg, Victor Perrin, Paul Dubov, Frank Gerstel, John Daner, Lawrence Dobkin, and Chet Stratton. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Remember, we'll now be on the air on Sunday nights. The time will be listed in your newspaper with more exciting stories of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Welcome back. Overall, this was a solid serial that provided a great mystery and some solid action scenes. It doesn't quite have the emotional punch of earlier stories, but it still makes for a solid final installment. I read a comment a few months back on the first time we played this serial asking why listeners would view it as good news to get less yours truly Johnny Dollar. While I understand the perspective, I think we have to understand this from the perspective of the network, the production team, and the audience of the era. The serial era was a massive undertaking, which often featured multiple new locations to provide sound effects for, and required an hour-long script every week. As an audio drama achievement, it is outstanding. 55 stories told over 57 weeks involving 280 separate 15-minute radio episodes. In all but two cases, the writers were bound to keep the stories to a limit of five parts. It wasn't like the old juvenile serials where you could drag out a storyline for five or six weeks, and throw in some actor vacation time in the middle by having the hero locked up or knocked out and letting a side character lead the action. These were stories with depth and breadth, but that were also limited and required discipline in writing. The easy way to have done this would have been to phone it in, produce workmanlike products, but instead were treated to a combination of creative writing, great direction and spot-on acting, often with striking top performances. And while I poke fun at the mistakes in the individual stories and episodes, the little issues that they had are understandable. The massive amount of time and effort that must have gone into editing so many scripts and keeping track of all the stories in the production all the stories being solicited, the plot outlines, the continuity and direction must have been incredible. That the serials turned out as brilliant as they did was an outstanding achievement reflecting a dedication to excellence. The Johnny Dollar serial era is among the best achievements in the art form of audio drama, and it should be celebrated and recognized as such. At the same time, it also had to be incredibly expensive for this late stage of the golden age of radio. Even paying union scales to the actor and 
paying Bob Bailey a salary of less than $200,000 a year in today's money for one of the best acting performances of all time, the payment to writers and even union scale over five 15-minute episodes each week certainly would have added up for CBS. For all but a week and a half of its run, the serial was unsponsored, and so CBS ran it to the degree that it fit within their own strategy for radio. Its new strategy involved giving comedian, game show host, and singer Robert Q. Lewis, who hosted a Saturday morning program, a nightly hour in prime time, which left no room for nightly adventures with yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The positive spin of Bailey's closing is justified from this perspective. One episode of Yours Truly Johnny Dollar per week was better than no episodes. It easily could have been canceled. Instead, it was sent to CBS's weekend schedule, where other CBS dramas like Indictment, Gunsmoke, Suspense, and the CBS Radio Workshop aired. The series had survived, and given that it was 1956, that was something to celebrate when every show was getting canceled. Johnny Dollar had made its mark. Jack Johnstone had revived and revitalized the series. Newspaper reports praised it as a highly successful serial series, and it was. It delivered mystery, drama, and even a few laughs. Unfortunately, it couldn't fix the long-term problems of CBS and the radio industry as a whole. As a series, it could do everything but bring itself sponsors. Even in ending the serial run, no one at CBS wanted Johnny Dollar to hand in his last expense account just yet, and so the series continued as a weekly feature. This was a credit to the star, the showrunner, and the rep company cast of talented supporting actors who made the series so great. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar would survive for six more years, but it would be a hard scrabble existence with Jack Johnstone having to fight the forces of the light stage entropy of the golden age of radio and low budgets to deliver an entertaining program. It wouldn't be as great as the serial era, but that wasn't for want of trying. Listener comments and feedback now, and we turn to a comment on YouTube from Nightshade1682 regarding the Primrose Matter. The last time the Primrose Matter came up in the rotation, you remarked on how absurdly focused Johnny was on his assignment because he used his few seconds of time alone with Jenny to ask if she knew where the money was. But consider... If Jenny hadn't known, then Johnny would have had to get the information from Nitsen, a dangerous suspect. But with the money secure, Johnny evidently had no qualms about bashing an unaware Nitsen in the head with a baseball-sized rock, a move that may well have killed him. Well, I appreciate the comment. Now, I, I'll I'll be honest. I do not go back and listen to what I said the first time. I did that once, actually, uh, this run through the serial area, just to see if I caught something the first time around. But generally, I prefer not to be influenced by my past self. I don't want to end up just repeating automatically the thing that I said 10 years ago. Even if I'm going to come close to saying the same thing, I I want it to at least be a bit original. That said, I think I did have a point to, uh, to an extent because if you don't find out where the money is... You're going to have to deal with Nitsen anyway, because if you're dead, you can't recover the money. Now that said, you might be right, and Johnny might be right, and maybe I just don't have what it takes to be a great insurance investigator, because I would be more concerned about personal survival than recovering the money, because you want to do your job, but, you know, staying alive is kind of important, too. But thank you so much for the comment, and I'm glad that you reminded me of that. All right, well, now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day, and I want to go ahead and thank Peter. Peter has been one of our Patreon supporters since April of 2022, currently supporting the podcast at the Seamus level of $4 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Peter. 
And that will actually do it for today. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And if you're enjoying the podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. We will be back next Friday with the first of the half-hour Bob Bailey episodes. And join us back here next Tuesday for the return of Dr. Tim Detective. But check back tomorrow for Dragnet, where... Hey, Romero, Friday. How's it going, Lieutenant? Not good. You met Mr. Jimison? Oh, sure. Sit down, gentlemen. Would you like some coffee? I can have the no, wife thanks. make some. No, thank we you. We didn't want to bother the girl's parents any more than we had to. Jimerson here is one of the neighbors. He's been nice enough to let us use his phone. The kids disappeared about four this afternoon, is that right? At 3.45. Got out a local broadcast on him. Here's a missing report. Thank you, Tim. Thelma Griswold, age 11. Barbara Sperry, seven-year-old. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram. Instagram.com slash Great Detectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.